Today's scripture reading is from Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 29, and it can be found on the screen. Let us pray. Living God, help us to hear your holy word with open hearts, so that we may truly understand, an understanding that we may believe, and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Peter's declaration about Jesus. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say, I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. We're going to pick up on a theme Scott read earlier, uh, Jesus asking the disciples, well, who do you say that I am? And now John the Baptist is sending his own disciples to Jesus and saying, Are you the person? Who is this Jesus? Listen for the word of the Lord. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So sometimes I can be pretty vain. And proud, and I have a few years of seminary training under my belt. So I like to think that I have a lot of this God stuff figured out. My children often teach me that I have very little figured out. Our family had this beautiful German Shepherd a few years ago when we moved to Idaho. The year Ellie was 13 years old, and a year and a half ago, we took our beloved German Shepherd down. We still talk about Ellie to this day. So at bedtime, Laurel asks her, one of these theologian father, Daddy, will I see Ellie in heaven? Of course you will, Laurel. <clears throat> well, how does Ellie get to heaven? Well, Jesus takes Ellie to heaven to be with God. Well, how does that happen? Does God come? Does Jesus come? What's the difference between God and Jesus? I just don't understand this, Daddy. And I'm struggling to articulate to a four-year-old uh, the difference between God and Jesus. Now, I am a little bit shocked that she never talks about the Holy Spirit. It's a good Trinitarian Presbyterian. Uh, but who is God and who is Jesus? This is the question that we have been talking about, perhaps allowing it to change as we go through this sermon series, the three big questions, who is God, who am I, and what is love, we're going to be building on each question, each topic, week by week. So if you were here last week, you noted that I said culture tends to operate in a religious view that says God is out here and I am out here. And I said this is a crazy heresy in the Christian worldview because as Christians, we believe that God is all around us from beginning to the end, the Alpha and Omega. God is time itself. God is life itself. And we as created beings find our life in God. It's in God and that we live and move and have our very being. And we talked about how this can be a dominant mindset, even amongst many of us sitting here today when we live our life. And we believe that God can be a million miles away. The reality is that our very being is in 
God. So this was last week, and a very astute observer commented to me, you know, Kevin, that was a, a good sermon, but you really didn't talk about Jesus at all last week. And I said, oh, come back this Sunday because we're going to build on that. And today I want us to be able to articulate the answer to the question, who is Jesus? Now, sometimes I encounter people that say, you know, Jesus is just some made-up character that many Christians believe in, right? But the reality is, not only in our faith, but in the academic world, and in the best world, both of those are married hand in hand, right? But even scholars of history who are not Christians, who do not believe that Jesus is Lord, they will say that Jesus of Nazareth is a historical person. Besides the documents that we find in our Bible, there are many extra canonical writings about Jesus. Fancy word to say outside of the Bible. There's a lot of literature in the first century about this Jesus of Nazareth. Indeed, a Roman historian in the first century describes an event. He's not a Christian. He's a pagan. Uh, but he describes this event that's described in Acts. Solotomius um, writes about there was a fellow named Christus who sparked this riot in, uh, in Rome. And the emperor expelled a lot of the Jews because of the riot that this Crestus was around uh, caused. So we can believe with all of our heart that Jesus of Nazareth is a historical person, flesh and blood like me and you. He lived 2,000 years ago. And in our confessions of the Presbyterian Church, we note this, and Jesus of Nazareth, true humanity was realized once and for all. Jesus is a Palestinian Jew. He lived among his people. He shared their needs, temptations, joys, sorrows. He expressed the love of God in word and deed and became a brother to all kinds of sinful men and women. The Confession of 1967 is uh, one of the confessions, beliefs that we adhere to in the Presbyterian Church. So Jesus is real. Like There's no denying that this Jesus of Nazareth existed. So who is he in our Christian faith that makes him our Lord and not just some legend of 2,000 years ago? So if we buy the concept that we live in God, Jesus is that entity which brings us sinners who believe that we have been separate from God back into the realm of the reality of God. And because it's cute, I put the cross in this connector piece between God and the created beings to bring us back into this sense of oneness with God. And Jesus is that connector here that takes what we want to believe is separate and makes it whole. It's in Jesus that we find our wholeness. Now, there are a few beliefs in Christianity that we note of this person of Jesus of Nazareth. We believe that he is the fullness of what humanity was intended to be in the first place, having this intense love of God the Father and a love for fellow man. Jesus is the fullness of who we are and who we are called to be. But as Jesus takes on flesh and blood, temptation, joy, and sorrow, we simultaneously believe that Jesus is the fullness of God. Fullness of humanity, fullness of God, all in one being named Jesus of Nazareth. There's a fancy $2 theological word that describes this. A hypostatic union which just simply means that Jesus is fully human. We also believe that he is fully God, all in one being, and you can't separate these two distinct selves. So we don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth is some Superman, right? He had flesh and blood. He was killed just like me and you. We will die also, right? But in that same being is the fullness of God, which allowed him to raise in victory over death. Hypostatic union. So how often do we teach our children that Jesus is some super, superman? Jesus pled. Jesus wept. He 
God takes on our flesh to experience this world just like we experience this world so that we might be brought back into unity with God. Does that make sense? There's a fourth century theologian named St. Athanasius who has this saying has been repeated, especially in the Catholic and Orthodox Church. It may be a little new to us Protestants, but this is Orthodox Christianity here. God became a man so that man may become God. To bring us back into this unity in which we were created, right? We believe that we are separate, but Jesus and the cross works to bring us back into the fullness of God. Are you with me thus far? Some heads are nodding yes. Thank you very much. So what is this process called of Jesus bringing us back into our true relationship with God? Another fancy word that we hear in our Bibles that I struggle to understand is this word called atonement. But if you break it down, at one mint in the English, the process that God uses to bring us back into the fold, to ignore or to break down those barriers which we think are in place between us and God, Jesus is that act of at one mint, atonement. The Bible describes a lot of images that we use as Christians to bring us back into one being with God. The Confession of 1967 says this, God's reconciling act of Jesus is a mystery, which the scriptures describe in various ways. It's called the sacrifice of a lamb, the shepherd's life given for his sheep, atonement by a priest. Again, it is ransom of a slave, payment of a debt, vicarious satisfaction of a legal penalty, and victory over the powers of evil. There are a lot of different ways we can describe how Jesus brings us back into the at one moment or the atonement with God. But the confession says these are all expressions of a truth which remains beyond the reach of all theory in the depths of God's love for us. They all reveal the gravity, the cost, and the sure achievement of God's reconciling work to enable us to know that we are part of God's kingdom. So if we believe that we're separate from God, Jesus is the one who is bringing us back into the fold of God. Scott read a terrific passage of scripture where Jesus is with the disciples and asks, well, who are people saying that I am? Some say, uh, Elijah. Well, who do you say that I am? And I think that we all, as human beings in 2019, get to answer the question versus just people who live on the earth. And more importantly, as people of faith, who do you say that Jesus is? He's a real person in the history of the world, and he said things like this. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophet hang on these two commandments, bringing us back into at one moment through love, loving God, loving neighbor. He also says things like this, that seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. Jesus said, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that you may see your good, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So this Jesus of Nazareth saying these things about our relationship with God and one another. And he also says this, and this is the verse that has struck me since the day that I came back to my faith. Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. <laughs> Repent and believe this good news. And why is this good news? Because for so long, we had believed that God was far away and we 
had to have the correct behavior and the right attitudes and the right beliefs. And if we did X, Y, and Z, maybe God would bring us back into the fold. And the per person of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus is saying the kingdom of God is right at hand. In Luke, Jesus is reported as saying the kingdom of God is within you. And friends, this is good news. If God isn't far out there, but God is here and all around us. This is the message that Jesus is saying. And this is powerful. Not only powerful for me and you, but it was powerful in the time in which it was preached. This is the message that fermented a movement that has changed history as we know it. Our time, 2019, is based upon the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And in the New Testament, we see this movement of Christianity exploding across the Middle East. And this Historians of the world in the high school history class, we know that Christianity has changed the world, sometimes for better, right? Sometimes for worse. But this Jesus movement for the past 2,000 years has been powerful and vital. And I believe it's been vital because something real happened in the person of Jesus. Those first disciples, their lives were changed. They committed their lives. They left their family. They went out to share this good news that in Jesus, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news, my friend. God is not out there. God is right here. And in fact, God is within you. Heresy to a Roman pagan. Good news to those of us with hearts in that age. So we get to answer this question. Who do you say that Jesus is? And with thanks be to C.S. Lewis and Mark Behrman, we can say that Jesus is one of four things. We can say that he's a liar. That this historical person of Jesus of Nazareth, these things that he said are just simply not true, and we can walk away and not believe it. That would be something that I do to lots of theologians, sometimes even in our Christian tribe today. I think that they say the most God-awful things representing our faith. So I just say, this person is not true, and I walk away. We could do that with the person of Jesus, right? We could also say that this person of Jesus who claims he is God is a lunatic. That the things that he says, the things that he does, uh, are just simply... Beyond my rational belief, these are the acts and words of a crazy man, and we can walk away from that as right. Bart Ehrman, a contemporary scholar, would say, uh, you know, Jesus, this whole story is just a legend about some powerful figure in the past. Uh, and a modern-day scholar could say, yeah, this legendary story has the capacity to change the world and both politics and people's hearts. I disagree with all of these analysis. Because as I look at history, and I look at my life, and I look at the life of many of you sitting here, I believe that there is something out there. And what Jesus has done, and what Jesus continues to do in our lives. So Jesus looks at Peter. Jesus looks at me, and Jesus looks at you and says, who do you say that I am? And the only answer that I can give witness to, both with my brain and with my heart, is that Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is the one who brings the fullness of God in and all around us, in spite of my own inability to do so. And me wanting to stay a sinner and look inward, Jesus is the one who has saved me and continues to save me. Who do you say Jesus? Who is he? Paul the Apostle took this question to heart, believing that Jesus was the Lord. Jesus was the one who allowed him to find the fullness of God in his own life and in the life to come. So he writes these words to the church in Corinth and the church in Covenant. He writes, so if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become 
new. All this is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And he closes with this line. For our sake, he made him to be sin, he's talking about Jesus, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness on our own, my friends. We're so apt to worry about our own daily cares and agendas and concerns, but the reality of God is that, that this whole thing is one in and of the person of Jesus Christ. And he does this so that God's beloved creation, me and you, might realize our oneness of God so that we might become this righteousness. So when my daughter asks in bed, well, who takes Ellie to heaven? Is it God or is it Jesus? I don't know that we need to know the mechanics of the answer. But here's what we need to know as Christians. As long as I can point my daughter and my son, two people in my life that I give my life for, right? <laughs> I can point them to Jesus. Jesus will reveal all the mechanics of that, right? I don't need to worry about that. They just need to know Jesus. And it is the same with you, my friends, my parishioners, my beloved sisters and brothers in Christ. I don't I know that I don't need to have the mechanics of how all this works. But if I can just point you to Jesus, I can trust that you will find a home at one with God. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers, would you dare confess with your mouths? I pray that you will have the courage <clears throat> that when Jesus asks you, who do you say that I am? That he's not some liar or mythic religion. That you can say, ah, oh, Jesus, my Lord, we pray with you. Lord, we confess that we would rather worry about uh, our work, our families. We would rather worry about all these things in life that in the end are fleeting. We pray, O oh God, that as we hear the message of Jesus, that you would inspire within us this sense that it is only Jesus that brings us to the fullness of God. Lord, may we repent of our selfish ways. May we repent of everything that takes us from you so that we can turn towards you and know the reality of the world, that we can find our, the fullness of ourselves only in Christ Jesus, our Lord.